It's kind of a snow day, at least here in Michigan. Not a lot going on here in the shop, so I want to just have a little bit of fun today. Four years ago, I made a video that discussed whether radial arm saws are more dangerous than table saws. And as you might expect, it made a lot of folks angry because people just have strong opinions on issues like that based on which tool they happen to prefer to use. But what was kind of lost in that debate was the sheer comedy of the absolutely reckless and nonsensical things that radial arm saw manufacturers used to recommend that users do with their saws. For example, as someone who grew up around a radial arm saw, we didn't even own a table saw, I described the process for cross-cutting a full sheet of plywood. You stood the sheet on end in front of the saw on the floor. Then you turned the blade towards you, right about at gut level. Then you push the plywood through the blade, sliding it along the floor. If you finished with your arms intact and your bowels still inside, it was a good day. Now when I first described that in a video, some folks called me a liar. They couldn't believe anyone would do something like that, let alone that a saw manufacturer would actually encourage such a stupid technique. So I got out the old manuals, including this one, a 1954 guide similar to the one that came with my grandfather's saw, which was the one I grew up around. And here's one of the methods they recommend for breaking down a sheet of plywood and possibly opening your stomach in the process. This is real, folks. Fortunately, even as a child, I thought this was dumb and I never attempted it myself, but I believe my grandfather did. And this wasn't even close to the only dumb thing radial arm saw manufacturers used to outright encourage. Some of the stuff in these manuals is so stupid, it is downright hilarious. So today, for the sake of a few laughs and a little levity, we're going to revisit the most entertaining parts of that original video with those manuals. I'm going to leave out all the debate about the saw itself. I'm not saying radial arm saws can't be used relatively safely. We're just talking about the dumb stuff the manufacturers used to tell you to do with them. Then in the comments below, I'd like to hear what you think of some of these things. Is it as dangerous as it looks? For decades, they were marketed as all-in-one machines that could cross-cut, rip, bevel, dado, sand, grind, plain, turn, make cappuccino, route moldings, raise panels, slice lunch meat, plain boards, you name it. This is a 1948 DeWalt radial arm saw instruction book. This is from around the time when these saws were first offered to consumers so folks could come home from their stressful office jobs to their sheds and basements in the suburbs and unwind with a little woodworking in their shirt and tie while the little lady fixed them a martini. These images aren't great, but even in the beginning, you can see all the things they claimed you could do with these saws. You see that one right there? Look at how much of the blade is exposed by the very nature of a blade being entirely above the table, as it is on all radial arm saws, and only half of it at best covered with a guard. If that board has a crack in it that you didn't see, or it kicks back and ejects across the shop, which can happen, where is Ward Cleaver's hand going to end up? How about now? This guy's serious. Can you think of a worse way to cut a rabbit? How about if we throw a much more aggressive blade, like a shaper on there? They called this tenon cut seemingly difficult at first. If all that exposed blade doesn't tighten your pucker, you and the Brady Bunch can make some great furniture together. And it got worse as time went on and the brain boxes and marketing kept overruling the engineers. Here's one, the two-point shaper cutter. It's basically a lawnmower blade for your saw. You want to experience some real click back or climb? put on something that can take enormous bites out of wood at 3,500 RPM. Here, Father Knows Best is raising a panel with no blade guard and with the workpiece trapped between the blade and the table. If something causes that panel to lift and put pressure against the flat part of that spinning saw plate, it could be goodbye panel and hello hooks for hands. A sanding disc doesn't have teeth, but that doesn't mean the edge won't cut you. And if you've ever used a high-speed orbital sander, you know what can happen if that disc isn't perfectly flat on the wood. Is your grip of that board stronger than half a horsepower? What could go wrong here? Check out Mr. Loose Sleeves. Where's your push stick, buddy? Interestingly, while they continue to put out these brochures showing all sorts of unsafe practices and a conspicuous absence of safety equipment, the lawyers must have been getting nervous because they began hastily throwing together separate safety tip sheets, obviously pecked out in some broom closet on an old Remington typewriter and then secretly slipped into the boxes because they directly contradicted things seen in the official brochures. Now let's get back to that plywood question. When the radial arm saw started taking off, so was plywood for the consumer market. 
and working with those big sheets could have thrown a wrench into DeWalt's plans to replace the table saw completely. So they had to MacGyver a solution. Here they show what looks like a rip right down the middle of a 4x8 sheet in the same manner you would do it on a table saw. But to do this, you have to rotate the blade carriage so that it's spinning in the opposite direction from what it would be under normal ripping conditions. Then you rip from the opposite side, from left to right, while remembering that all other rips have to be done from right to left. Keep those feed directions straight or your saw will self-feed both the wood and potentially your hands right into the blade. That's okay for rips, but do you remember how to cross cut a sheet of plywood? On the end, of course. Just turn the blade so it's cutting completely unprotected at gut level, and then slide that sheet right on past. But don't do this if you've had too much dinner. You might end up with the first half of a tummy tuck. Now some of you are watching this and saying I'm being too dramatic. All these worries are based on worst case scenarios, and you're absolutely correct. But it's within those worst case scenarios that life changing injuries occur. You know darn well a router table or a shaper with proper safety devices is a safer way to raise a panel. But that radial arm saw is just sitting there, and the brochure makes it look so easy. My one arm buddy Cletus has made lots of raised panels on his, and he says it's not too bad if you're careful. I bet my chances of getting hurt are one in a million. I like those odds. You have to divide that one in a million by the four sides of your raised panel. Then you have to divide it by the number of doors in your kitchen cabinets. Then divide it by the number of times you're going to repeat that task in your lifetime. Those one in a million odds just became about one in a thousand. That's better than your chances of winning 25 bucks on a scratch off ticket at the Piggly Wiggly. Again, we're talking about getting hurt using a radial arm saw for something it shouldn't be used for, like raising panels or cutting yourself in half. Come on though. Would big companies like DeWalt or Craftsman risk suggesting something they knew was unsafe? Yes, because they wanted to sell saws. They weren't afraid to lie to you. They put the biggest lies right on the front of the brochures. Look at this 1949 ad saying it will cut accurately in any angle. Anyone who has used a radial arm saw for long knows this is not true. They cut accurately if you keep them well tuned and the arm locked at 90 degrees. I know folks who have actually tack welded there so that arm stays at 90 degrees. You start pivoting and rotating and doing all this nonsense with the radial arm saw and you'll be spending half your day realigning it just to make straight cuts again. That's because the saw itself simply wasn't made for all this nonsense. DeWalt developed the radial arm saw in the 20s for cross cutting large timbers that were too long for a table saw. Big versions with 16 inch blades were used in mills and factories. They were rough cross-cutting tools. But those guys were definitely shrewd businessmen. They sold millions of radial arm saws to folks who believed the photos in the brochures and thought they were buying a miracle tool when they were just buying a Swiss Army knife that did a lot of things, but only one of them well, cross-cutting. That's why when compound miter saws hit the market, radial arm saws hit the curbs. You can get them pretty cheap today without hardly looking. And I don't want you to get the wrong impression for this video. I'm mocking the marketing and all the crazy dangerous stuff they said you could do with the saw. I'm not saying the saw itself is useless or inherently dangerous if you use it in the proper way. For goodness sakes, do not copy that stupid stuff you see in the old catalogs with those weird attachments and even some of the irresponsible videos I see on YouTube. This is not a router, folks. DeWalt's from the 50s are some of the best looking power tools ever made in my opinion. That's what I have and it's stored in my shed because I just don't find it that useful and space in my old shop is at a premium. But now that I have a bigger shop, I may bring my grandfather's radial arm saw back in and make some videos about it. I'll see you then. I've used a lot of feather boards over the years, but the Bow Feather Pro has really caught my attention. The finger is easily bent in the feed direction. That produces just the right amount of pressure for a smooth and even feed rate. But should something go wrong and the saw decides to kick that board back at you, the unique curved shape at the top of the fingers combined with that living hinge at the base produces a cam-like action that greatly increases the pressure and virtually locks the board in place. The manufacturer claims five times greater pull resistance than a standard feather board, but I think it's more than that. It's really a unique design that honestly has changed my attitude about how useful feather boards actually are as anti-kickpack devices. Maybe you should get just one of them so you can try it for yourself. I'm sure you're going to agree that it is the smoothest and potentially safest feather board you've ever used. 
And they come from a small family business that's run by two brothers who came up with this great idea in their garage and they've built a business around it. I love supporting things like that. So I'll link to them below this video.